the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today, dear brothers and sisters, we continue the celebration in many ways of the glorious feast of Pentecost. As we know, last week we celebrated the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, and in the earthly sense, the formation of the church. But we also understand, dear brothers and sisters, that the church has existed from eternity. And on Pentecost, we have the manifestation amongst God's creation of that eternal reality, which is the Bride of Christ. The Holy Father's right of Pentecost as the undoing of that which was done by God in response to the desire of humankind to build the Tower of Babel when he confused the tongues. In Pentecost, we have the proclamation of the message of Christ and of eternal salvation in all the tongues of those who could understand. And in this, we have the unmaking of that which God made to prevent humanity in its pride from seeking to place itself where only God should have been. We know that Christ promised in his earthly life to send to us the paraclete, the comforter, the helper, his Holy Spirit, that we would not be deprived of the grace of God even after he was taken back up to sit at the side of his Father. And so we celebrated last week, according to the church calendar, from now until we begin our preparation for Great and Holy Lent, we number our Sundays according to Pentecost. And this should be a reminder to us, dear brothers and sisters, of not just the bestowal of the grace of the Holy Spirit upon us, but also upon the fact that we are called upon to be fruitful in the exercising of that grace. And this is what we see in today's feast, the feast of all the saints who have shown forth at all times and in all places. If we listen to the epistle reading this morning, we hear talk of those faithful before the coming of Christ who wrought deeds in the name of God, who did mighty works on behalf of his name, but also we hear of those who suffered for the name of God. Those who were sawn asunder, who were torn, who were destitute. All of those who suffered for Christ without having had the benefit of seeing the incarnation of the promised Messiah. Towards the end of that reading, we are told that even despite these things, despite the suffering of their tribulations, despite the doing of the great deeds, despite prophesying the word of God, they without us could not be made perfect. They did their works by faith, and this was accounted unto them for righteousness. But it wasn't until the coming of Christ and the bestowal of the Holy Spirit that they could be sanctified by grace. And this with us, as the church universal, as one body of Christ. If we listen to the Gospel reading, which is very closely connected to the reading from the Epistle, we hear that only those who are willing to set aside father and mother and the desire for all earthly things in their desire rather for Christ will be saved. This of course doesn't mean that we need to be willing to turn our family members out, but it means that we need to have within our hearts at all time the desire for Christ and that should be the highest desire in our lives. As we know from our experience of the church, the church takes those things which we bring to her with good faith and good intent. And she blesses them, she sanctifies them, and she returns them to us multiplied, manifold. And so it is with our earthly relationships. If we sanctify them by dedicating them to God, by loving God first and foremost, then God takes these relationships too, and he blesses them and he sanctifies them, and he multiplies them, and he returns them to us. This is the great lesson of all the saints who have shown forth in the church, that they, through the witness of their lives, whether they were martyred or not, whether they were persecuted for their faith, or whether they lived their faith out unknown to the rest of the world, but known to God, this is the living witness of the church, that those who have come before, and those who are manifest even in our times, those who love Christ above all else, we see a sanctification, a changing, a blessing of everything around them. When we look at Saint Seraphim of Sorov, the beloved saint of the Russian church, and beyond the Russian church, he who is known even outside of the circles of orthodoxy, we see someone who in his great love for mankind was given to converse with the wild beasts, 
who was given to see the unoriginate light, who was given to share the experience of that light with others around him. We see in Saint Seraphim one who was so enmeshed in the love and life of Christ that at every season, no matter what the day, he would greet another person with, my joy, my joy, Christ is risen. This is the joy that we should have in our hearts. This is the surety that we should have in our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the desire to seek him first and foremost that we should have as well. And this is the witness of the church. In the season of Pentecost, we see the manifestation within the church and within those who make up the body of Christ of the grace of the Holy Spirit, which was bestowed upon the apostles and through them to the entire world. This is our legacy. We are given the saints for many reasons to commemorate. First and foremost should be that we learn to emulate their example. We may not be able to emulate the circumstances of their lives, but we can certainly strive to emulate their love for Christ and the manner in which that love plays out in their interacting with everybody else. In the early church, the citizens of the Roman Empire looked at the, the burgeoning Christian movement and they said, see how they love. This is how Christians were known, by the fact that no matter the outward circumstances of their lives, they were so radiant with the light of Christ that they could not help but make an impression upon the world around them. And if this was needed in that time, in a time when the world had succumbed to paganism, how much more so is it needed even now, when again the world is returning to that same paganism? We see this in society around us. We see this in the dictates that are being issued concerning not just the private lives of citizens, but the communal life of the entire country and even of the entire world. The world is falling back. The world is falling away from belief in God. And it is precisely in this time that we are called upon to manifest our witness. And that witness may be as simple as a life lived in Christ. It may be as simple as saying our morning and evening prayers with diligence and not just praying for those whom we love and who love us, but praying for those who vex us, those who get on our nerves, those whom we don't like. This is the measure of a Christian. The measure of a Christian is not doing the easy things. The world can do the easy things. The measure of a Christian is taking up the cross, which Christ enjoined his apostles in today's gospel reading to do, and following after him by crucifying ourselves fully upon that cross, by crucifying our desires to satisfy ourselves, and rather by seeking to satisfy the needs of another, even if that another happens to be somebody that we don't particularly care about. We may not like other people, but regardless of how we feel about them, we should strive through the grace of God to love them. God loves all of his creation, and the measure of our stature as Christians in the judgment will be at least in part how well we have loved everybody whom God has brought into our lives. It's easy for us to share our Christian faith amongst those who believe as we do, who profess as we profess, who reinforce that belief. It's easy for us to do this in community. It's not nearly as easy to do that outside of the temple, but this is precisely what we are called upon to do. And this also is the living witness of the church. The church has at all times sought not just the transformation of the faithful, but beyond this, the transformation of the entirety of the world, and even beyond this, the transformation of the entire cosmos. This is what we choose to participate in or not, by choosing to live the Christian life or not. Dear brothers and sisters, we have to understand also that in our private lives, there is no such thing in the fullest sense of the word as a private life. There is no private virtue, and there is certainly no private sin. Every time that we commit an act for the good in remembrance of Christ and dedicated to our neighbor, we participate in the creative works, the ongoing works of God, and that has cosmic significance. Likewise, when we sin, when we fall short of the glory of God by seeking our own will, our own desires, when we seek to satisfy our own lusts of the flesh or of the other senses, this also has a cosmic dimension. This is the time in which we align ourselves not with the creative works of God, 
but with the destructive works of Satan and his minions. There is no middle ground in the spiritual life. We are either actively seeking Christ and working to further his kingdom, or we are not. The world would say that there are shades of gray, and in the application of this, there may be. We may have choices to make in our life, gradations, but ultimately everything comes down to either choosing Christ or not. There is no middle ground for the Christians in the exercising of their faith. And this is the lesson that we should take from the lives of the saints as well, that all of them, with one voice, in many different ways, but with one voice, they all sought to glorify Christ. They all ultimately made the choice of the kingdom rather than of the world. May we, as we move through the season of Pentecost, as we celebrate the feasts of the church, and as we continue to see the unfolding manifestation of Christ and His Holy Spirit within His creation, may we seek to emulate these saints. May we seek to acquire the grace of Christ, to desire it above all else, and to desire once we have been given that great gift by God to share it with others, to the furthering of the kingdom, and to the salvation of us all. Amen. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen.